Good evening all and welcome to the last plenary lecture of the day and that's entitled Targeted Therapy in Advanced Thyroid Cancer. My name is Abdul Rauf Al Mahfoud and I'm consultant endocrinologist at King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center in Riyadh. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight's plenary lecture. Who's Dr. Ali Zahrani, somebody I know for over 30 years and who I worked with for over 20 years. Dr. Ali Zahrani does not need further introduction. He is very well known locally and regionally in the field of thyroid cancer. He's currently consultant endocrinologist at uh, King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center and a professor at Al Faisal University. He's also an executive director of our research center and he has a very active 20 years in the field of thyroid cancer. He published over 150 peer review articles and has given over 200 lectures regionally and internationally. His interests are in academic interests are clinical and molecular research in the area of thyroid cancer and endocrine genetics. Uh, not to forget to mention that he was editor-in-chief in our, of our journal, uh, Annals of Saudi Medicine, and was in the editorial board of the Thyroid Journal and the academic editor in the PLOS One Journal. Today, he's going to talk to us about an important topic, which is targeted therapy in advanced thyroid cancer, an important topic for our thyroid cancer patients who, who for a few years ago had nothing to turn to when the, the, when the time comes to RAI refractory stage. So without further ado, the virtual floor is yours, Ali. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you today about uh, targeted therapy in thyroid cancer. I'm very pleased to be here, and I would like to thank the organizing committee for um, choosing me to give this uh, topic. So I have nothing to disclose, and uh, the outline of my talk tonight will be uh, a little bit of epidemiology and background, and uh, briefly describe the standard management of thyroid cancer. But we will focus on the genetic underpinning of uh, thyroid cancer that has led to major advances in the targeted therapy, And if we have time, we'll look at some future projections. So we, you all know that thyroid cancer has been increasing in its incidence over the last three to four decades. And there is no question that this is uh, related uh, in, in part, at least, to the widespread use of imaging techniques. But there is some data suggesting that there is a genuine increase in thyroid cancer. Now, the good news, as you can see on the top of this slide, is that uh, the, the five-year survival and the 10-year survival is excellent. This, this data is from uh, SEER data in the United States, and you can see that the five-year survival is 98%. And the mortality has been always uh, low and consistently low, despite the increasing rate of uh, thyroid cancer. So we all know that differentiated thyroid carcinoma comprises around 90% of thyroid cancer. The other 10% is divided between um, anaplastic thyroid carcinoma and medullary thyroid carcinoma, and sometimes some other rare cancers. The overall 10-year disease-specific survival is excellent, as we just mentioned, more than 95%. And we know that the modern uh, management for thyroid cancer these days is actually a lobectomy or a total thyroidectomy, depending on the risk of the patient, uh, and uh, selective use, more selective use these days of iodine-131 in the intermediate to high-risk patients. So with this management, we achieve around 98% five-year survival. However, somewhere between 10 to 15% of patients have metastases, and a good percentage of them, they have progressive metastasis. Here is a patient that uh, I'm talking about, where you see on the left side, iodine whole body scan, and there is nothing there, but you can see clearly in the middle, extensive lung metastases, and you can see this clearly on the CT scan on the right side. This is the subject of today. I'm not going to discuss the management of the usual patients that we uh, usually cure them with, uh, with surgery and plus minus radioactive iodine, We're talking about uh, about 10 to 15% of patients who have very aggressive disease that leads to uh, major morbidity and uh, not uncommonly morbid mortality. 
So talking about the distant metastases, as I mentioned, about 10% have distant metastases at, at presentation. In our series, 13% of our patients present with distant metastases. 6 to 20% recur at distant sites. And the overall disease-specific survival for patients with distant metastases is only 50%. So the 90% uh, or 98% that we see in uh, in, in overall patients is not seen in patients with distant metas. Only 50% overall disease specific survive. And actually two thirds of those patients with distant metastasis, they de-differentiate. In other words, they lose the ability to take up iodine. And this subgroup uh, is really uh, the highest risk group. Those patients that 10 year disease specific survival is only 10 to 20%. This data is coming from France, from uh, the Institute uh, Gustave Rossi, uh, of 444 patients with distant metastases. And as you can see in this Kaplan-Meier curves, uh, patients who retain the ability to take up iodine on the upper, uh, upper curve, they do much better than those who lose the ability to take up iodine. Those who lost uh, iodine affinity they don't do well at all. You can see that their five-year survival is in the range of 15 to 20%. So this is one of the major uh, uh, flags when we see patients with distant metastasis uh, telling us that they will not do well. And we have frequently to look for other options for them because we lost one of the most important tools to treat those patients, i.e. I-131. And that brings us to this term that was introduced in the ATA guidelines in uh, 2015, radioactive iodine, refractory, progressive thyroid cancer, abbreviated sometimes as RARE, R-A-I-R. Uh, previously, this was called uh, generally TG positive scan negative disease, but now the term is radioactive iodine refractory progressive thyroid cancer. And this is the type of thyroid cancer that needs usually targeted therapy. So what is rare or radioactive iodine refractory differentiated thyroid cancer? Again, this was defined in the guidelines as structurally evident differentiated thyroid cancer uh, that is seen in patients with appropriate TSH stimulation and a pro, uh, uh, proper iodine preparation in four basic ways. Either the disease uh, never concentrate radioactive iodine from the beginning, or it has lost the ability to concentrate radioactive iodine, or you see some lesions taking up iodine and others do not, or finally you see a good uptake on the scan, but the disease is progressing structurally and anatomically. So those four criteria, at least by the guidelines are the definition of radioactive iodine refractory differentiated thyroid carcinoma. So what is the recommendation for this type of disease? The recommendation that you should not uh, continue to give those patients radioactive iodine uh, because uh, essentially it's ineffective. And this is, as you can see at the bottom, a strong recommendation. So what are the options for those patients? Uh, there are many options. However, one of the options is targeted therapy. Uh, but uh, target therapy is not without risks and with, without side effects, major side effects. And therefore, the recommendation to treat those patients with rare or radioactive iodine refractory uh, thyroid cancer is if they have oligometastatic uh, distant uh, disease and it can be resected, surgery is still an option for those patients, even with distant metastasis, if it can be resected. TSH suppression is very important in this group of patients if they have differentiated thyroid carcinoma. Uh, if, there are, uh, if there is an uptake of radioactive iodine, then radioactive iodine remains an option for differentiated thyroid carcinoma. If they are stable, despite the fact that they have distant metastasis, observation is a good option for those patients. Again, if there's a, a lesion that is causing trouble, and it can be resected or irradiated or uh, destructed in some way, thermal ablation or immobilization, that's also uh, a good option for those patients. For patients with uh, skeletal metastases, bisphosphonate or denosumab 
are good option for those patients to maintain their skeleton. And there is some soft data suggesting that they even lead to some regression of the tumor or at least stabilization of the tumor. If all of these fail or are not feasible options and the patient is having progressive disease, this is when we start to think about kinase inhibitor or multi-kinase inhibitors. And you can see here on the right side, uh, the indication to use uh, tyrosine uh, kinase inhibitors include failure of alternatives to systemic therapy and acceptable performance status. The patient should be in good shape to tolerate those toxic drugs. And one of the following, symptomatic disease or disease that's threatening vital structures like the spine or the brain or major fissile or clinically significant disease which is rapidly progressive or in the case of medullary thyroid carcinoma, particularly, they tend to have paraneoplastic uh, features, including sometimes uncontrolled diarrhea or Cushing syndrome, and that's also an indication. So you can see from this pyramid that, uh, is, that was published in a very important review article in endocrine revision just two, two years ago, that the decision to use tyrosine kinase inhibitors should not be taken lightly and uh, should only be used in patients that are more likely to benefit than to be harmed of, by those drugs. And this comes, of course, with experience and, uh, and with assessment of patients uh, uh, case by case. So here is a patient who has widespread metastasis to the skeleton, lung, brain, and uh, uh, the question, what could we have uh, provided this patient with 10 years ago in 2010? And the answer is nothing more than thyroid hormone suppression. But today, 10 years later, in relatively short period of time, we have so many options for this patients. On the top of them is tyrosine kinase inhibitors that we will discuss in a minute. So the field has, uh, has gone through dramatic changes in the last uh, uh, 10 years and um, uh, is likely to continue to show um, major advances in, in the treatment of this such patients. So uh, what can we offer this patients? You can see on this, uh, in this diagram, several multi-kinase inhibitors that were not there 10 years ago. None of this was familiar to any of uh, the people treating patients with thyroid cancer. Now you can see that we cannot keep up with the, with the, with the number or the, or the names of those drugs. And uh, that's, that is related to our understanding of the molecular pathogenesis of thyroid cancer. So in this diagram uh, from, again, a very important review article that was published early in the course of this uh, advancement in 2013 by Brian Hogan and Stephen Sherman, uh, two prominent thyroidologists, you can see that in the left side, this is a tumor cell. On the right side, you have vascular endothelial cell. And what you see inside the tumor cell is two important pathways. On the right side, you have the MAP kinase that start with tyrosine receptor kinase, uh, which stimulates RAS and RAS activate BRAF, BRAF activate MEC, and MEC activate ERK and ERK activate number of transcription factors inside the nucleus, okay. leading to proliferation, invasion, tumor formation, a metastasis, and so on and so forth. The same thing on the left side here, you have the BI3K AKT mTOR pathway, and it has basically, uh, it shares actually with the MAP kinase, the RAS, and the tyrosine kinase receptors on the cell surface. You can see also other uh, uh, drivers, including many tyrosine kinase receptors, RET, whether it's mutated with single point mutation or with fusion protein. You can see epidermal growth factor, MET, on the, on the vascular endothelial cell, which is thought to also play a major role in the pathogenesis. You have multiple tyrosine kinase receptors, PEGFR, vascular endothelial growth factor, epidermal growth factor. More important than all of this, you can see that we have now several inhibitors to essentially any of those mediators. Some of them are very specific, like deprafenib and fumarafenib, which specifically inhibit BRAF, selumatinib, tramatinib, are specific inhibitor on MEC, but some of them are multi-kinase inhibitors. They block more than one target. For example, you can see sorafenib here and here and here, 
and lymphatenib, the same thing. So we actually have two groups of kinases, specific kinases, sometimes referred to as monokinases, uh, and multikinases, which inhibit more than one target. Now, uh, thanks to uh, people who were working for the last two decades to define the molecular uh, genetics of thyroid cancer. This is a very important study that uh, was published in Cell in 2014. This is part of the Cancer Genome Atlas that defined actually the genomic landscape of well-differentiated, well-differentiated papillary thyroid cancer and included around 498 cases of well-differentiated. And as you can see here, we have many, many mutations. Uh, I will summarize them in a minute for the sake of time, but you can see BRAF is the prominent player here. RAS mutation, RIT rearrangement, third promoter mutation, and B53 is only uh, less than 1%. We have also on the lower panel, down here, fusion protein, red PTC, uh, NTRK fusion protein, BRAF uh, fusion protein, and so on and so forth. The story is complicated and uh, that this needs a lecture by itself, but I'm just showing you the highlights. So the question uh, is that we have now known uh, to a great extent the molecular genetics of well-differentiated papillary thyroid cancer. So what about poorly differentiated thyroid cancer and anaplastic thyroid carcinoma? And this came only two years later in 2016 in this uh, article that was published by the group in New York led by Jim Spagan. What you see on the left side here is the poorly differentiated thyroid cancer around 85 cases. And on the right side, anaplastic thyroid carcinoma around 30 plus cases. And uh, the, the molecular genetics are different from the well differentiated. You can see TERT promoter mutation and B53 are the main players. TERT around 40% in the bully differentiated and 73%, 73% in anaplastic. B53, which is a very bad mutation, occurs in around 8% of um, uh, poorly differentiated and 73% of anaplastic. We have also BRAF and NRAS. We have red PTC and BAX8 PAPR gamma rearrangement. We have some histone modifiers and epigenetic uh, uh, players. Uh, the story is again very complicated and I don't have time to explain everything, but I want to summarize the main, um, again, players of uh, pathogenesis in, in thyroid cancer in general. So on the left side, you see the mutations in papillary thyroid cancer. The main thing, the main one is BRAF and red PTC. A uh, small per percentage, they have RAS mutation and then the others are very rare, except third mutation around 10%, 11%. In follicular thyroid cancer, RAS mutations and BAX8 PPR gamma are the main players. In poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma, we start to see a lot of TERT promoter mutation, B53 around 24%, and then RAS mutations. In the anaplastic thyroid carcinoma, the most aggressive one, B53 uh, stands up as a prominent player here. Uh, and then beta catenin and third promoter mutation. Now, medullary thyroid car carcinoma is a different story. As you know, third uh, red uh, point mutations are the main players, occurring anywhere between 60 to 90 percent of the sporadic and familial type. And around 30 to 40 percent of patients with medullary will have somatic mutation in RAS uh, gene. So again, this understanding of the molecular genetics of thyroid cancer in general led to uh, understanding of, uh, of, the, of the therapeutics, how to handle all of this. And this is another uh, representation of, uh, of the molecular genetics and the, the, the uh, 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 drugs that we can use for this. So this is again a tumor cell. On the left side, you have immune cell, the T lymphocyte, on the right side, you have vascular endothelial cell. So again, the MAP kinase and the BI3 AKT pathway and the multiple uh, kinase inhibitors that we can use, either a specific one like the brafenib and femorafenib, dramatinib and selumatinib for MEC, or multi-kinase inhibitors, including sorafenib, fendatinib, cabozantinib, bazobinib, sonatinib, lymphatinib, and so on and so forth. We have also some specific inhibitors of RET, like LOXO-292 and BLUE-667, we will discuss them. Specific inhibitors of NTRK, larotrectinib and intractinib, 
what happened in the last three, four years is exploitation of additional targets. And one of them is actually the immune system, immunotherapy. And as you can see in this diagram, you can see interaction between the tumor cell and the T lymphocyte. And this interaction happens through cell surface receptor, BD1, BDL1, uh, which inhibits actually the T lymphocyte. So this interaction leads to basically inhibition of the immune system. If we interfere here using immunoglobulin like this, then we release the T cell from this um, uh, tumor immunosuppression, and that leads to basically activation of the immune system, killing of the tumor cell, and uh, basically immunotherapy, one form of Im immunotherapy. You can see also additional things that we can, can do. We can reactivate again uh, NES, which is the sodium iodine symporter, to change this tumor from radioactive iodine refractory to radioactive aphid. Uh, we are, there are some studies now that are basically exploring the possibility of using the somatostatic receptors, which are present actually even in differentiated thyroid carcinoma and utilizing BRRT therapy, lutetium-177 or yttrium-90. So I think the field is expanding in a very fascinating way, and we are likely to see uh, uh, tremendous uh, uh, progress in the next uh, five years. Let's now uh, focus on the, on the uh, drugs that are in uh, use and approved by FDA. So what are the available drugs for metastatic thyroid cancer? We have two drugs for, uh, from 2013-2015, sorafenib and lymphatinib for radioactive iodine refractory differentiated thyroid cancer and bully differentiated thyroid cancer. And most recently, this is around two weeks ago, uh, cabozantinib was added to this list. So now for DTC or uh, bully differentiated thyroid cancer, which is rapid progressive and radioactive iodine refractory, we have the luxury of using sorafenib, lymphatinib, and if they fail, we use cabozantinib as a second line therapy. For medullary thyroid cancer, we have also two FDA-approved uh, drugs, vendatinib and cabozantinib. And in the last year, we had four new drugs, actually, and they are monokinases targeting a specific target. Two of them uh, target RET oncogene when it is mutated, and that's silvercatinib and braslatinib. And two of them actually target NTRK fusion positive tumors, and that include larotrectinib and intrectinib. And I will discuss this in details. Uh, more, most maybe uh, uh, important and, and really breakthrough in the treatment of anaplastic thyroid carcinoma, which is, as you know, is the most fatal human cancer and used to be deadly within a few weeks to a couple of months, is actually uh, the introduction of BRAF inhibitor, MEK inhibitor com combination for anaplastic thyroid carcinoma that harbors BRAF P600E mutation. And this is this happens actually in around 40% of anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. So patients with anaplastic thyroid carcinoma who has this mutation now can enjoy long-term survival and, and a regression of the tumor. And we'll discuss this. As I mentioned, there are many other ways to treat thyroid cancer. Most of them are still in trials and, uh, and uh, experimentation, but they are likely to be in, uh, in practice in the next few years. So let me uh, discuss uh, the first four drugs that uh, were approved, sorafenib, lymphatinib, amphendatinib, cabozantinib for differentiated thyroid cancer and medullary. I'm showing you this because this is the general scheme for uh, those trials. All of them are phase three trials. This is for Zeta study, which actually tested fendatinib against placebo. It's a phase three trial for uh, unresectable, locally advanced or metastatic uh, uh, MTC, and the randomization most of the time is two to one ratio. And this is the active drug against placebo and people look for progression-free survival. So this is the general scheme for all of those phase three trials that tested those drugs. And on the basis of this testing, FDA, FDA approved it. So let's look at sorafenib, lymphatinib, and then cobazantinib. So this is decision trial for sorafenib. And you can see in this Kaplan-Meier curve, that uh, patients who received sorafenib had much better um, survival of 11 months versus only six months for uh, a placebo. And on the basis of this, 
This was approved in 2013 by FDA. You can see a reduction of 40% in the risk of disease progression and death. This is selected trial for lymphatinib, the same design. The result is even more impressive. The median progression-free survival for lymphatinib is, uh, is uh, uh, 18.3 months and for placebo, 3.6 months. Uh, what about medullary thyroid cancer? We have two drugs, fendatinib, cabozantinib, the same design. This is Zeta trial for fendatinib. The progression-free survival is 22.6 months versus only 16.4 uh, uh, months. And uh, 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 on the basis of this, uh, fendatinib was approved by FDA in 2011. This is exam trial for cabozantinib. Again, you can see that um, uh, cabozantinib improved the progression-free survival from four months in the placebo to 11 months. And again, cabozantinib was approved by FDA for progressive medullary thyroid cancer. This is just a summary of what I have said, and maybe we can skip this slide. Basically, we have two drugs, sorafenib and lymphatinib for differentiated thyroid cancer, approved by FDA based on phase three trials. And medullary thyroid cancer, we have fendatinib and cabozantinib again approved by FDA for medullary progressive thyroid cancer. Then the, the, the uh, recent uh, addition is actually this drug, cabozantinib, which is used in medullary thyroid cancer since 2012, but now it is approved for use, be used, uh, for, to be used in differentiated thyroid cancer that is radioactive iodine refractory. And this was just approved in 17th of September, so around two, three weeks ago. And this is uh, uh, as a result of, again, phase three trial that is uh, randomized, double-blinded, for patients more than 16 years who were progressing on sorafenib or lymphatinib. So this is a second-line therapy. If a patient progresses on sorafenib or lymphatinib, then cabozantinib now is a second-line therapy. This is a two to one ratio randomization. The primary endpoint is overall response rate and progression free survival. You can see they recruited 187 patients from 25 countries, and the overall response rate was 15% in cabozantinib and 0% in placebo. You may, you may say this is not very impressive. It is very impressive for patients who already failed two drugs and have, have no other options. The medium progression-free survival is unreached in cabozantinib arm, which means it's, it's, it's working very well. And it was only two months in patients with placebo. Of course, adverse effects are common like any other tyrosine kinase inhibitors and serious side effects were even present in around 16% in cabozantinib. The again, uh, interesting addition that happened in the last year is those four drugs that we call them tumor agnostic drugs. And what does that mean? That means basically it does not matter what the histology is. What matters is what, what is the molecular uh, 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 pathogenesis? What is the underlying mutation? So if we have RIT uh, uh, gene mutation, whether it is point mutation or RIT fusion, whether it is in thyroid cancer or lung cancer or any other cancer, those drugs target that RIT and they are very effective. So most of the trials actually included number of uh, tumors and they, call, they are called basket trial because they include different uh, tumors with the same genetic alteration. And we have silvercatinib and braslatinib for RIT altered tumors. And we have for NTRK fusion protein, two drugs, larotrectinib and entrectinib. So this is the silvercatinib trial. It is phase two trial, actually. It's not placebo controlled, but it is very impressive that FDA approved the drug in November 2020. You can see that this is a New England Journal article in August 2020. I just want to again emphasize that uh, RET is altered in two ways, either rearrangement, which means basically part of RET is chopped out and replaced by uh, another segment from another gene, or point mutation, which means basically a single nucleotide in the sequence of RET is changed. This is common in medullary. The, the point mutation is, is classic for medullary, and uh, RET fusion is a classic for uh, differentiated thyroid cancer and lung cancer and other types of cancer. So this is uh, the silver catenib again, uh, a trial, and you can see here three groups. On the top here, we have uh, patients 
55 patients with medullary thyroid cancer that uh, they were treated previously with vendatinib and cabozantinib. And you can see the waterfall blot is showing you impressive result in essentially everybody except three patients on the left side. In the middle, you have 88 patients with medullary thyroid cancer progressive, but they are treatment naive. They did not receive pendatinib or cobazantinib in the past. And you can see that all of them responded beautifully. Some of them actually achieved complete response, 100% uh, disappearance, actually, of the tumor. And down in there, you have 19 patients with um, uh, uh, differentiated thyroid cancer. Uh, that carry red fusion protein. And again, the overall response rate is around 80%. Progression-free survival at one year is 64%. And I just want to, again, remind you where's the, the, the site of action of those uh, drugs. So the site of action, as you can see on this diagram, red is, you, is on the cell surface. So when it is it has a point mutation, that's where it is. When there's fusion, uh, red PTC, it is usually in the cytoplasm. So those drugs, silpercatinib, inhibit the red oncogene, and therefore it inhibits basically all the MAP kinase and BI3 kinase and halts the whole pathogenesis of thyroid cancer. And you can see here, the results are impressive. Almost mirror image in the pralsatinib, the blue 667, Again, three groups, uh, differentiated thyroid cancer with the fusion protein, 11 patients, and you can see that the overall response rate is 90%. At six months, 100% of them are responding, and everybody is showing a response on the left side here. On the right side, you have the upper panel with patients treated previously with cabozantinib or pendatinib, 53 patients, and down you have treatment naive patients, 19 patients. And again, the overall response rate is anywhere between 60% and 74%. NTRK fusion protein is another type of fusion protein. And NTRK is a, is a gene that is involved in the central and peripheral nervous system uh, function. But when it is mutated, when it is fused with another gene, it becomes an oncogene. So it, it drives the cell basically for tumorigenesis, as you can see on this diagram. And again, to show you where NTRK is, it is here, it's in the cytoplasm. When it is activated, it activates RAS, and RAS activates the MAP kinase and BI3 kinase leading to tumorigenesis, et cetera, et cetera. So what are the drugs for NTRK fusion uh, tumors? Again, uh, uh, these are number of tumor. NTRK is not specific to thyroid cancer. It occurs in multiple cancers. But for thyroid cancer, that is the subject of today, you can see it occurs in adults up to 36% and in pediatric up to 26% of patients. And if they have this fusion protein, they are lucky. They can respond nicely to those drugs. Darotrectinib is one of them. And you can see the overall response in this trial, basket trial again. 83%. And you can see down here in the waterfall plots, soft tissue sarcoma, infantile fibrosarcoma, and then thyroid, salivary, lung, and so on and so forth. And all of them show consistent response, reduction in the size of the tumor, regression of the tumors, sometimes complete uh, responses. Uh, let's just review briefly the, the, the uh, data on thyroid cancer when they have TRK fusion. Again, this is for larotrectinib. Uh, we have 28 cases, including seven patients with anaplastic thyroid carcinoma, which is, as we just mentioned, is a fatal disease. We have 19 patients with papillary and two patients with follicular. And you can see here, again, beautiful response in essentially all patients except three. All of them showed excellent response, including patients with anaplastic thyroid cancer and poorly differentiated. Some of them achieved complete re response, which means basically 100% response. Uh, let's talk about anaplastic thyroid carcinoma, which uh, used to be fatal uniformly until 2018, when uh, it was found that if it carries BRAP mutation, then patients respond nicely. This is, a, a, again, a landmark study that uh, was published in JCO, uh, and is basically only 16 patients. Probably this is the smallest study in the history of FDA on the, on the basis of which a drug is approved, or, or uh, two drugs in this case. So dabrafenib, which is a specific inhibitor for BRAF mutation, and tramatinib, which is a specific inhibitor for MYC, were combined together to treat number of tumor that have BRAF 
mutation. And this is the data on anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. As you can see in the plot on the right side, everybody responded beautifully, significant response. Only one patient did not respond. And you can see one of those patients down here at baseline, large tumors. And when you go down after eight weeks of traumatinib, debrafinib, almost complete disappearance of, the, of the, the tumors. Not only this, the response is durable. It starts at around two months, but you can see many patients enjoy very good response after 100 weeks. And uh, the, the latest data is actually three, four years. Uh, uh, some patients are taking the drug for three, four years and showing a consistent response. Now, we uh, mentioned earlier that uh, to start those drugs, you have to be careful. You should not uh, start them uh, lightly uh, because of their side effects. And you can see the side effects are shared by many of them, much less common in the selective monokinases on the right side, the silvercatinib, ralsatinib, larotrectinib, and intractinib, much less common and less risky than the multi-kinase inhibitor, the lymphatinib, sorafenib, pendatinib, and cabozantinib. But they all share those side effects of hypertension, diarrhea, skin rashes, anorexia, fatigue, weight loss, QT prolongation, hand food syndrome, uh, increased uh, 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 liver enzymes, and uh, even fiscus perforation, death, uh, hemorrhages, uh, this is a part of a, a long list on the clinicaltrial.gov, uh, which lists uh, all the trials in, uh, in, uh, in thyroid cancer. And this is probably representing less than 20% of the trial listed there. What I want to show you is there are so many kinase inhibitors on the left side here. They are in phase one, two, three trials. There are combination of drug, a combination of therapies, including tyrosine kinases, immunotherapy, so the field is evolving at a very rapid rate and we are likely to see uh, very good uh, uh, results. In the last part of this talk, I'll just talk about additional, uh, additional opportunities to help those patients. We talked for the most part about tyrosine kinase inhibitors and we have covered them to a great extent, but as, as there are other areas that we can use. And one of them is resensitization. Again, trying to get those tumors to take up iodine and treat with this uh, old uh, treatment med modality. We talked about uh, somatostatin receptor and using uh, uh, PRRT, and we talk about immunotherapy. So let's briefly look at the data on this. So resensitization to radioactive iodine, BRRT and immunotherapy. So the first attempt or proof of principle was uh, this article in 2013 using silumatinib, which is a MEK inhibitor to resensitize advanced thyroid cancer. This came again from uh, Jim Spagan's group where they gave patients silumatinib for four weeks, 20 patients were included and they had scanned before and it was negative. After four weeks, they did scan and 12 out of those 20 had positive scan. Eight of them were actually uh, had significant uptake to the extent that they were treatable with, again, with radioactive iodine and they were treated. And many of them showed stable disease or even partial response. So this was like proof of, uh, of principle. And you can see some of those images from that study, negative scan after silumatinib, very frank positivity. You can see here on the right side, again, at baseline, and then after silumatinib in the bilfus and in the skull. Uh, this is a study that came from uh, uh, Dana-Farber uh, Cancer Center in Boston, where they treated with another drug, daprafenib, which is a BRAF inhibitor. And they treated 10 patients for 28 days and then they scanned them, uh, uh, six out of 10 became positive, and then they were treated. And as you can see here, the resist uh, response was very favorable in many of them, around five of them showed partial or uh, stable disease, partial response or stable disease. This is an experience at MD Anderson of 13 patients treated either with BRAF inhibitor or MEK inhibitor, and then they were scanned out of the 13 patients, nine uh, showed positivity and were treated with radioactive iodine. And at eight months, three had partial response and six had a stable disease. And you can see here on the left side that um, negative scan before, positive scan after, some of them showed frank and impressive uptake. You see this patient, for example, was negative and after treatment with BRAP uh, uh, inhibitor, extensive uptake in the lungs and so on and so forth.
Finally, there are case reports uh, published even in New England Journal of Medicine of patients using silpercatinib or larotrectinib for a few weeks and then changing from negative scan to positive scan. You can see this is silpercatinib, this is larotrectinib, and both of them showed excellent uptake after a few weeks. What about PRRT, the somatostatin-based therapy? Again, this is the largest study from Germany. 41 patients with rare type of tumor underwent gallium-68 dutatate PET whole body scan. And 11 patients were treatable, and they were treated with yttrium-90 dutatoke. And two of them showed partial response, five stable disease. Remember, those patients were pro having progressive disease, so seven out of 10 had stabilization or even partial response. The final thing and the most actually active area in cancer therapy in general, not only in thyroid cancer, is the immunotherapy. And there are different ways to do immunotherapy, but the checkpoint inhibitors is the most successful. And again, in simple terms, if you look, uh, look at the right upper panel, you have a tumor cell in the middle interacting with, uh, uh, sorry, you have a tumor cell on the right and left and a T cell in the middle. And there is an interaction between the tumor cell and the T cell. What the tumor cells are doing, they are inhibiting the T cell. And there are, through those mediators, you see on the lower side here, stimulatory and inhibitory. Most of the time they're using the inhibitory uh, signals. And two of the inhibitory signals are well characterized. The CTLA4, CD86 interaction and the BD1, BDL1, BDL2 interaction. And um, if we use immunoglobulin to break this cycle, the T cell becomes so active and it really uh, 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 kills the, the tumor cells. And many times it results in excellent response. And this is very advanced actually in hematological malignancy in breast cancer, colon cancer, and uh, renal cell carcinoma and some CNS. It is still in early stage in, in, uh, in thyroid cancer, but it is showing very promising results. These two scientists won a uh, Nobel Prize in 2018 for their discovery of those molecules, the CTLA4, uh, CD86, and BD1, BDL1 uh, molecules, because this has changed the field of cancer therapy. Uh, on the left side, James Addison from MD Anderson. On the right side, Hasuku Hanju from Japan. The, the, uh, the Japanese scientist uh, discovered BDL1 and the American scientists uh, uh, discovered CTLA4, and they won Nobel Prize uh, for their discovery. So some of the trials in uh, thyroid cancer, CTLA4 inhibitors, we have this study of 49 patients with aggressive types of tumors, including DTC or ATC or MTC, and treating them with uh, nifilumumab or ibilimumab uh, led to actually a partial response in three, and complete response in one, including three uh, partial response in anaplastic thyroid cancer, complete response at 13 and 26 months. This is another uh, uh, anti-BD1 inhibitor, uh, sorry, bimbrolizumab, which is widely used in breast cancer and renal cell carcinoma. This is um, uh, 22 patients treated uh, in England. Uh, and as you can see, the waterfall blot here again is showing you that large percentage of them showed excellent response, uh, including even uh, uh, partial response in two and stable disease in 13. So a significant number of them showed a stabilization or regression of their disease. Uh, another anti-BD1 uh, uh, receptor in 42 anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. And again, the waterfall plot on the right side showing you that around 40% of them showed excellent response. Finally, combination of immunotherapy with chemoradiotherapy was tried. This is an attempt in a Mayo Clinic of three patients with ATC. Initially, they showed excellent response. However, they all died. So this was like a fa failure. Uh, so to conclude, uh, uh, the field of uh, target therapy in thyroid cancer and other types of cancer uh, is progressing at a very fast rate and amazing results. The multikinase and monokinase inhibitors have uh, revolutionized the management of patients with progressive metastatic thyroid cancer. Currently, we have sorafenib and lymphatinib for differentiated thyroid cancer and bully differentiated thyroid cancer. And most recently, cabozantinib was added to them as a second line therapy for uh, differentiated thyroid cancer that failed sorafenib and lymphatinib. For medullary thyroid cancer, we have fendatinib and cabozantinib. 
And for BRAF positive uh, anaplastic thyroid carcinoma, we have the combination of BRAF inhibitor debrafenib and MEK inhibitor tramatinib. These drugs uh, definitely made major change in the quality of life and uh, progression-free survival and probably overall survival. New specific target therapy, the monokinase inhibitors are more likely to take the place of the multi-kinase inhibitors because they are even more effective and with less side effects. And we are, more, we, we are likely to see more and more of this. Many drugs and a combination of drugs, including immunotherapy, uh, including resensitization technique, including somatostatin receptor utilization, and including CAR T cells that I didn't have time to talk about it, are in the pipeline and are uh, likely to change the whole scene, not only for thyroid cancer, but for many other cancers. And with this, I'll stop. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ali, for a very uh, informative and comprehensive coverage of this subject. Um, and that brings us to the end of this plenary session. And thank you, uh, our uh, audience, for, uh, uh, for staying uh, till this uh, late hour and wish you a very uh, enjoyable and, uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, productive meeting. Thank you and good night.